name is Dawn Breen, and I'm Associate Curator of Decorative Arts here at the Frick Pittsburgh. And welcome to The Frick Reflects, Looking Back, Moving Forward. In a year that marks the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Frick Art Museum and the 30th anniversary of the opening of Clayton to the public, we are taking a critical look at our permanent collection. We know that museums are not static entities. Like the art and artifacts they display, museums are products of their cultures and times. And the Frick Pittsburgh is the result of one person's vision, our founder, Helen Clay Frick. The society and culture in which Helen grew up, as well as her position as an extraordinarily wealthy white woman living in post-Civil War America, shaped her perspectives and values on society, class, race, gender, preservation, and philanthropy. Those beliefs, in turn, shaped our institution, and the artworks and objects in our collection can tell us a lot about these often under-the-surface assumptions. The meanings that these objects manifest have never felt more relevant in this particular period. We're in a global pandemic and a nationwide reckoning with race and social justice. We're questioning the role of our institution within our community, as well as the position of museums in systems of power and privilege. Whose stories do museums tell? Whose stories are excluded? And how do museums participate in the construction of meaning, knowledge, and memory? This is an exhibition that raises challenging questions, and we invite you to consider them with us. The Frick Reflex is meant to be an initial step in an ongoing process to acknowledge and confront our institutional history. We are questioning what values guided our founding, what values guide us today, and what values will guide us into the future toward becoming a museum where all visitors feel valued, welcomed, and respected. So the exhibition is organized thematically and is framed around a series of overarching questions. So the gallery that I'm standing in now really looks at the 19th century society and culture in which Helen Clay Frick grew up that shaped a lot of her early ideas about class, race, and gender. And one of the first questions you encounter is, how does a collection assembled in privilege speak to us today? And we're really looking at Helen's very unique position. She had a nostalgic love for her childhood home, and she had the means to be able to preserve that home. But we can't ignore the fact that Helen's lived life was far from the lived reality of most Americans around her. So what can these objects assembled from that position of privilege tell us about life in the 19th century and what do they tell us about Helen? Another section in this particular gallery questions, what should a boy know about the world? But we also could have called it, you know, what are children in the Gilded Age learning through play? And it really looks at different gender roles between boys and girls. And we pulled um, childhood toys that were owned and used by Helen Clay Frick and her brother, Childs Frick. And we're really looking at the messages and assumptions of those objects. For example, we have a number of adventure books and swords and display souvenirs, travel souvenirs and ephemera from Childs Frick's library and his bookshelves at Clayton. And they tell us a lot about how other cultures are viewed from a very 19th century Eurocentric perspective. We also pulled a number of objects owned by Helen in her childhood and as a contrast from the books that Childs is reading, which are all about kind of worldly adventures and, and wars and exploring exotic locales, girls are being shaped to be um, household managers, wives, and mothers. And even as a wealthy young girl, Helen's toys really reflect those gender assumptions and the societal expectations that are being placed on girls in the 19th century. And of course, for all of their privilege, the Frick family had a lot of intense loss and grief during their life at Clayton. And so we do pull some objects that look at the Victorian custom of mourning and memorialization. The Fricks lose two children within one year of each other, um, including their eldest daughter, Martha Frick, who dies just a few days shy of her sixth birthday, and then an infant son, Henry Clay Frick Jr., who dies during the summer of 1892. So we have some images that relate to the memorialization of Martha and Henry Clay Frick Jr. And we talk about the environment that Helen is really growing up in, you know, being surrounded by these images of her sister and how the Victorian customs of memorialization really shape Helen's later efforts in memorializing her father as she is an adult. 
And of course, we can't look at the Frick family without talking about Frick as a businessman because their wealth came from his position in the coke and steel industry here in Pittsburgh. And Frick has a complicated legacy, to say the least, in Pittsburgh and industrial histories. But it's an undeniable fact that he is one of the formidable figures really shaping American progress through industry. So we take a look at Homestead and how those events likely shaped Helen's life and her perspectives on industry and labor. The final section in this gallery asks, where is a woman's place? And it really looks at those gender roles that are explored in the childhood section and how those ideas manifest as Helen grows older. In the late 19th century, there is an increasing emphasis of the true woman to the new woman. And women are leaving the home in greater numbers and participating in activities outside of the home, whether that is social reform movements, education, or the workplace. And Helen is in her formative years as these changes are taking place. In a lot of ways, she subverts the societal expectations that have been placed on her as a young woman. So we really look at this section as a way of celebrating her as our female founder, while also acknowledging some of the contradictions her life embodies as well. In this gallery of the Frick Reflects, we pick up the story in 1919 with Henry Clay Frick's death. His death sets in motion, really, the bulk of Helen's story as an adult. When Frick dies, Helen inherits $38 million, making her the wealthiest single woman in America. And here we explore what she does with that wealth. Among other causes in building her own collection, she is primarily focused on building and preserving Frick's legacy. She commissions an astounding number of posthumous portraits of her father, she founds institutions in his name. She even takes up a lawsuit with a historian to protect his character. The list of institutions she founded includes the Frick Collection, the Frick Art Reference Library, the Frick Fine Arts Building, an art history and architecture program. She purchases Frick's birthplace and establishes a fund to preserve it and create a museum known today as West Overton. She also creates funds for the preservation of her family home here in Pittsburgh, known as Clayton. She later funds a building at the University of Pittsburgh known as the Henry Clay Frick Fine Arts Building. And after a dispute with them, she leaves and founds the Frick Art Museum. Clayton, the Frick Art Museum, and the Car and Carriage Museum would later become the Frick Art and Historical Center or the Frick Pittsburgh. In this gallery, we start to ask the question, what legacy did Helen Clay Frick want to build for her father? What did she want us to remember about him? And was she successful? What is Frick's legacy today? On a larger scale, we're asking the question, what are museums for? Who do they serve? And do people need museums to serve them at all? How do we take our institution, which was built on wealth and privilege and Gilded Age ideals, and make it relevant to our community today? How do museums participate in defining what culture is valued and what history is saved? So we're in the final gallery space of the Frick Reflex. And while the first two galleries really look at Helen Clay Frick's life in context, this space is a little bit different and a little more conceptual. And we really wanted to look at the position of museums and the role that they play as an active participant and kind of pull back the curtain in how we as curatorial staff kind of add to meaning and memory. Um, and it ended up being one of my favorite sections of the exhibition. It's been a really fun space to play with the concept of how we add to um, structures of power, what our jobs do, how we give objects meaning. Um, it was fun to explore questions about what objects end up in museums, who decides and how they're displayed, and into also thinking about our community and our responsibilities to our community and how our institution can grow. And in looking at the Frick Pittsburgh's collection and particularly at the story of Clayton and the Frick family life that was lived in this Gilded Age mansion, you know, the Frick family are not the only people living and working in that space. And they aren't the only people who are interacting with the objects that form part of our collection. So we really wanted to shine the spotlight on these individuals who are an equally important part of life at Clayton. And 
representation matters. And as a historic site, we're incredibly fortunate to not only know the names of many of the individuals who worked here, but to also have some photographs. So these are six of many staff members who worked at Clayton. Another part of this section of the exhibition is a historical timeline of events from 1840 to 1990 that was compiled by our colleague, Kim Cady. And she assembled this incredibly thoughtful list of historical events that put the Frick family's life in context, because it's really easy to see their life of privilege as being kind of insulated from a lot of the big markers of the civil rights movement, the Jim Crow era, and the labor and industrial strife that's happening throughout the 19th century and into the early 20th century. The civil rights movement that's happening while Helen is you know, building a museum to house her personal art collection. And it's so interesting to look at those moments in relationship with Frick family moments. It gave us the opportunity to think about how Helen's world changed over the course of her life how she responded and how she also did not respond and gave us a great place to bring some inclusivity into our galleries and think about different issues and different audiences. I think this section of the exhibition in particular is really gonna be a touchstone for us as we move forward and we think about ways of expanding our programming and expanding the Frick family history into being able to tell more stories. <laughs>